To say it's been a tough couple of months with COVID would be such an understatement. It's changed so much. It's changed the way we shop. It's changed the way we interact with each other. It's changed the way we worship. It's changed the dynamics of even sitting in this room with, the, with dividers up and with, with people watching on, online, which we appreciate you joining us today if you're online. It's created a lot of tension with, with when even to worship. When is it safe was the question we had. Some churches, I think there's still some churches who are not yet meeting. And there are some churches who never dropped a beat, never stopped. There are churches who are, who are coming back together and who are, who are seeing, seeing um, you know, people come. And there are churches who people feel afraid. We've seen churches who opened up and then COVID spread throughout them and then they closed back down. And started continuing worship online. And something happened in all churches. And, and, and I think that there just became a lot, of, a lot of stress. We began to be polarized. Polarized by what we saw in the news, polarized by which news we were watching. Things like masks became not even about health. It became about politics. It became a question of faith. And, and direction I was up in the air. When we started this year, we had a goal was to, for Hoosier One, and our goal was going to be that each person was going to decide someone they were going to reach out to. And we had a goal for, for looking at our pocket of lostness that we exist in as a church. We exist in a pocket of lostness that means that, that we are not keeping up just with the standard rate of Christianity as the areas around us. And we're looking at ways of making inroads. And then COVID came. And, and things that were, things, you know, some things got, became intensified and some things got set on the back burner. And I feel right now that there's just, with a lot of things that have happened, a, a tension, a disunity in our midst. I want to read something that, and this is, not, this is not in direct response to the letter. I've had discussions with the, uh, with the personnel team. I don't want you to feel this is directed at you. Um, the letter is intended to get some basic ideas. It's for each family to fill out some things they see that are encouraging, some things they'd like to see continue or, or maybe strengthen. It, it's supposed to be a, a, just a general, you know, how are you doing? How are we doing as a church? And what are some things, again, that, that you would like to see strengthened? The letter was not intended, and, and I've not seen any of them. I won't see any of them. But I feel like sometimes within churches, because I've seen it happen, we go about things in a way that is, is contrary to what we're trying to be about. There's something that I've said before and it's something that we need to have in our church. There's got to be times for there to be reconciliation. Um, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, there's a process for what happens. Matthew 18, 15 says, If your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Now, there are some things that, that aren't really critiques. They're not really strong feelings that, that, you, have, that have, you have been wronged. It's not that you have a grievance against somebody. And those are the things that this letter is, is, is asking for. What are the things that just you would like to see strengthened? What are some things you'd like to see improved? But then there are things that happen in a church where fellowship gets broken, where someone feels so grieved or, or someone, someone does something to someone else that they've sinned against them. It's in those opportunities and those times that the correct course of action is to go and talk to that person. It says in this passage, that if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Is there something that has happened 
between you and another church member, between you and another, another staff member, between you and one of the staff members of the church, that you feel like fellowship has been broken, then what you do is you go and you talk to that person, you and them. That's the first thing you do. There are other steps we'd like to take. This is the first one. And it says that if your brother, or if this individual listens to you, then you have gained your brother. Because yes, we are fellow church members, and yes, there are some of us who are staff members, but in Jesus Christ, we are family. We are brothers and sisters. And when fellowship gets broken, it hurts the family. When we talk to each other, when we forgive each other, when we're open and honest with each other, then there can be a restoration of family. Next Sunday is supposed to be our um, Back to Church Sunday. And again, it's going to be very small compared to last year. I would just like to see every person who regularly attends church to all plan to come on the same Sunday. You know, some people are here some, they're gone some, some people are going to be on vacation and they can't. Um, but if you regularly attend, if you're watching and you're someone who comes some and you're not so here sometimes, next Sunday I'd like us all to be here on the same Sunday. And the theme for next Sunday is Stronger Together. The sermon is on how a, a three-strung cord is not easily broken. And it says that we as a church family are strong when we are united together. But this Sunday, with all the stresses and with all the tensions and all that's going on in our world and all the different feelings and, and questions and, and theories, it's going to be a challenge to preach on the strength and unity that we have in fellowship when fellowship is broken amongst many of our people. If you have a, if you feel that your fellowship with someone has been broken in this place, go to them, go to them. Don't go to anybody else. Go to them and reconcile. There are other steps to follow. If fellowship has been broken, if you've been sinned against and you go and you talk to the individual and, and, and they don't listen, Scripture tells us, to, to uh, take one or two others, just one or two other people, and go talk to them. Again, for the goal of unity, for the goal of reconciliation. It's a word we know, we're familiar with the word, but what it means is that men there. We need that. We need that. We're family. So I pray for the unity of this church. And I don't know what the next steps are going to be with the letter. If it goes out, again, it is something to try and garner some basic information. But if fellowship isn't broken, then your first step is to go to them. I want to pray, and, and then I want to begin with the text that I was intending to share. But that's been on my heart. It's been on my heart for a while. We've got to be about our unity. And it's so hard right now. It's so hard because, because we've been told to be separate. And there's a feeling of separation even as we gather together. But let's work on our unity. You may not be able to go to see someone in person. COVID may dictate against you. Your health may call you to not do that. Their health may call you not to do that. But call them. And see if we can't make amends with one another. Privately, quietly, at first. So that we can have that fellowship once again. All of our worship, all of our preaching, all of our study needs to be played out in our reconciliation we've had with each other. None of us is perfect. None of us is, is, is righteous in our own deeds. 
for the cause of Jesus Christ, we can have his righteousness imparted to us. So we're all sinners equal at the foot of the cross. And we've all, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you've been adopted into his family. Let's talk to each other like family. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. I pray for this congregation. I pray with all the stresses and all the worry that's being in our jobs, in our families, in our health situations, in our family's health situations. We come to this place. We meet in this building. We, we, we talk to each other. And this is a place where we are to draw, to be able to go and be a refuge from all the other stresses of this world for a moment, for an hour, to sit here and to lift high your praises. Those praises are to be lifted in harmony, in unity. Our first greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. God, I pray that as we're all walking this path together, as we're all seeking a better understanding of how we're to operate with what's all going on in the world. May this be a place of harmony. May this be a place where we can hide in the rock of ages. Where we can look at each other with mercy and with, with a heart to do what is right. May we be able to cast away old hurts. May we be able to forgive old injustices. May our love for one another cover a multitude of sins. Let there be reconciliation. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you would like to ask you to please stand for the reading of God's Word. Micah 6, starting in verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord? And bow myself before God on high. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice? And to love kindness for mercy. And to walk humbly with your God. Heavenly Father, I pray you bless the reading of your word. May we today look at how we can do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our Savior, our Lord. Again, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You can have a seat. Almost... Well, a little over five years ago, I preached on this passage. Micah 6, 8, I kind of consider it my theme verse. I've asked myself often, how do I do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with my God? And for so many years of my life, it's been a personal question. How do I do that as an individual? How do I do that as a person? And, and, and it's in my inner, my relationships with each other, with other people, with other believers, within my family. How do I do this? And, and what's happened is in the course of my lifetime, this question of justice is growing. Justice is something we hear about a lot. I want to talk a little bit today, today about biblical justice as it relates to what is being taught to us 
in today's culture. We have in Micah a situation where the people of Israel have been crying out because of the way that they are suffering, by the way that they are hurting, by the plagues that have been upon them, by the injuries that they're dealing with. And they feel that God is being unjust. They feel that somehow in his dealings with his people, and because of the way that they are suffering, that God has, is being unfair or he's forgotten his end of the bargain. And so what Micah constructs, this prophet constructs for them, is a scenario of a grand courtroom. And he gives the people the opportunity to plead their case before God. And God speaks to them in this great court that he has established. Micah 6 1 begins, Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord and your enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. Israel is in a serious place here. Israel is a place as a nation where they again are going, essentially calling God out. They say, our lives are simply unfair. Many of you may feel that way today. Many of you may feel right now that life simply is not fair. You've served God faithfully for your Christian life. You've not been perfect, but you've tried to do the things he's asked you to do. You've tried to be the person he has called you to be. And something's going on that just simply seems absolutely unfair to you. You may be at the point where you're actually angry with God. You may not verbalize it, but if you were to really think about it, and when you think about God, you think about your relationship, you begin to feel a sense that God just really isn't upholding what he said he would do. That's where the people of Israel were, and they were crying out to him. And he says, let me hear what you had to say. The people are angry at him, and he calls out to them. He stands as, as his character witness, and he says to them, verse 3, O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. And then he begins to declare to them the things that he has done for them. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. He freed them. He brought them out of the bondage of sin, the bondage of Egypt, the bondage of slavery. What has God done for you? He has freed you from the curse of sin, from the bondage that the sin places on you. He makes it free so that you can go and live a life that is pleasing to him. No longer are you controlled by the whims of your flesh. You are con controlled by the Spirit of God, or at least you are strengthened by the Spirit of God. He has made you a promise that you will spend eternity with him in glory. And he says that he will watch for you and defend you and provide for you. All those things he has done. And many, many more. The gifts that he gives you. The friendship that he gives you. The abiding presence daily that he walks with you. All these different promises that God fulfills in you. He wants to remind you of those things. He calls those things to memory. So rather than us going to God with an indictment, what we should go to him is forever with gratitude for the blessings he has given us. He says, And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, strong leaders to help guide them and lead them through the wilderness, through their early setting up as a nation. And we know the people revolted against them. We need to be in prayer for those who are in leadership above us, and we need to be praying for those leaders who are coming down the road. We need to be praying for the leaders of our nation. We need to be praying for, for our president. We need to be praying about the elections. God sends people to, to reign over, and we need to be praying that those people would listen to God and follow his wisdom, and that God would bless us through the leadership that is established. He put leaders in charge of the people and as they went out, and he says in verse 5, O oh, my people, 
Remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Baar, answered him. This is an Old Testament reference that I'll try to give you it to you in a nutshell. Basically, the king Balak um, wanted to curse the people of Israel. And so he called for Balaam, this, this, this prophet, if you will, to speak a curse against the people of Israel. And every time Balaam uh, spoke, he actually spoke a blessing over Israel. He couldn't curse Israel, he blessed Israel. But so as to try and, and, and hurt Israel, the king and Balaam devised a plan. They said, what you need to do is, we, I can't curse them, I can't curse the people, you need to devise a plan to cause them to sin so that their God will deal with them. And so what's what they did? They sent in young girls from, from the um, young women from the surrounding areas to go in and entice the men into sin, into fornication, into worshiping pagan deities. And so then God dealt with his people for going against his ways. We live in a world that is saturated, saturated with gratuitous sexual imagery and 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 we have got to be steadfast against it from the things on your prime time television to the things on cable to the shows on netflix i'm sure you've all heard about the recent show that they came out that that sexualizes young girls and they, the, they say we're doing that to show how wrong it is but they're still doing it and we've got to guard against that, and we should be speaking out against that, and we need to be praying for our fellows, our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we can, 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 can find a way out of that, because we are so surrounded by it. It's hard to watch a show today that doesn't have some sort of, of illicit affair going on. That is what brought the people of Israel low was their immorality and then following after other deities. God is saying, I brought you out of slavery. I would say he frees us from sin. I established leaders to help guide you. Again, I say we need to be praying for those in leadership above us. Then he says, but remember what happened. Remember what happened to the people of Israel. And I said we need to be constantly reminded of the sins and situations around us that we need to be constantly vigilant against with our minds, with our eyes, with our mouths, with our hands, our, from head to toe. We need to be vigilant against these things. God tried to protect them. He says in this, that what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. Time and time again, even after they rebelled against God, they sinned against God, God would speak to them and he would free them um, from the, if, as they sought forgiveness from him, he would reestablish that covenant relationship with them or honor that covenant relationship. So the people come back to God. God says, remember these things. If the people come back to him and they say, in verses 6 and 7, 6 and 7 is, is mock worship. 6 and 7 is not them opening up their hearts to God. It is them saying, just what extreme do we have to go to please you, God? With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? That was a customary offering. That was a standard thing, to come before God, to humble yourself and, and offer up that young calf. But then they kick it up a notch. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands rivers of oil? See, now they're getting a little sarcastic with it. What do I have to do to make you happy, God? Do I have to go to church and sing praises to you? Do I have to get up every morning at five and pray to you for ten hours and, and, and give bukus and bukus of money? Is that what you're asking for of me, God? Then they kick it up a little bit more. 
Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my oil? Do I have to sacrifice my firstborn child to you, God, to give to you the fruit that I have created to pay for my sins? Is that what you want? Such arrogance from the people. As if, as if God hasn't told them time and time again what he wants from his people. Pleasing God doesn't, isn't some grand mystery that we have to jump through all these hoops and all these things to please God. God's wrath has been dealt with by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Your sins are paid for. Now that's the New Testament being able to look back upon a passage like this. We understand that grace. We understand that blessing. The Old Testament looked towards it. We look back to it. But what does he call us to do? Verse 8. He has told you all, man, what is a good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Now I said at the very beginning that this concept of justice has expanded in our world. And the big, the big key right now is the phrase you're going to hear is social justice or economic justice. And the idea is a sense, basically... I'm no, I'm no political theorist, okay? I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn it. I'm trying to understand it better. But what it sounds like to my ears is that many people have lived under oppression for a long time, and the only fair thing to do is take from the haves and give it to the have-nots, is my understanding. And that is essentially social justice. Try to even things out. Try to make everything basic. Try to everybody have the same thing, and that way, that's justice. One writer gave the illustration of a father playing ping pong with his young son. And one of the players was really racking up the points against the other player. And at the end of the game, it was like a huge distance. It was like, what do you play, 21 in? It was like 2 to 21. And the dad won because he was taller and stronger and faster and more coordinated. And they both had fun playing it. And then somebody stepped out from, the, from watching and said, that's not fair. That's not the fair way to do this. The justice in this situation would be that you tally up the score and you count the number of players, you divide the score in half, and each one of you gets an equal amount of scores. That way, it's fair. And it takes into account the inadequacies between the adult player and the child player. And it keeps there from being any shame against the younger player for not doing as well as his father. And that's what's fair. And what I want to say is that there's a, I know there's a lot more behind this kind of theory that's been going on for so many years. But when the Bible speaks about justice, that's not what it's referring to. There are other things in our world right now that we're seeing where people are crying out justice. And honestly, as we look at it, it breaks our hearts. And it angers us. We live in a nation where protesting is is one of our freedoms. Praise God it is. Protesting is a wonderful way of showing, of showing our support or disapproval of things. But when it goes to rioting and looting and burning, that's not justice. When it goes to pulling people out of their cars and beating them in the streets, that's not justice. This, this uh, recent case with Brianna Taylor. They were boarding up the city and blocking off the streets before the outcome of the trial was even known. That's the world that our current system of this idea of justice is setting up. Where before the case is even determined they're predicting like a storm, like a hurricane coming in. Destruction and mayhem. And it happened. Officers got shot. 
And you say, Matthew, we know that that's not justice. I need to say it because apparently some people never heard it. Hurting, destruction, injury. That is not what the Bible calls us to be when he looks at justice. I want to read some passages of Scripture to just deal a little bit with what God says, what God's Word says about justice. Justice deals appropriately with those who do right and wrong. When justice is done, it brings joy to the righteous, but terror to the evildoers. That's Proverbs 21, 15. Isaiah 61, 8 says, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Psalms 106 says, Blessed are those who act justly, who always do what is right. Justice comes with a blessing. Justice is part of who God is. Isaiah 30, 18 says, The Lord longs to be gracious to you, therefore he will rise up and show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. Proverbs 21, 3 says, To do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Did you hear that? More than, more than, than, than tithes, more than offerings, more than making amends for wrongdoing, what God wants us to be are people who do what is right and what is just. It should be a demonstration of our love for God. That's what God wants more from us than, than, than empty offerings. God wants us to work for justice. Isaiah 1-7 says, Learn to do what is right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause for the fatherless. Plead the case for the widows. In that culture, that was the very, I'll use it like this, the lowest of society were the fatherless and the widows because they had no way of making income. They had no way to defend themselves. They had no way to take up for themselves. It was easy to abuse the orphan and the widow. And we look at our culture and we should ask ourselves, who is being abused and how do we begin to help those individuals? We as a church, we collect money. We take up, we take up our offerings. Part of that gets sent to the North Carolina Baptist Children's Home. You know, we, we talk about our offerings and we talk about them being ministry, and they absolutely are. But realize what that is doing is going to help the very people God calls us to help so they can have a taste of that justice, of security, of a home, of a place where they are loved. We, as a church, give a little bit to the uh, Crisis Pregnancy Center here in town so that mothers who are trying to make the decision between keeping their child or aborting them have somewhere to go and talk to someone who will share with them what God's love means and, and help them make a decision that's honoring to Him. And if they have gone and, and made a, a, the wrong choice, as I would say it, they have counseling to help these women. We give to that because we are trying to help these people. We collect food for the food bank so that people who are hurting, who are hungry, can go and find a place to get a little bit of bread and a little bit of food. Southern Baptist, we as a Southern Baptist church, we as this church, we are trying to practice these forms of justice out of our love, out of mercy, out of, out of the freedom from what God has given us. We do it freely rather than being forced into it. That's biblical justice. Justice is to stand up for what's right even when others don't. Exodus 23, 2 says, Do not follow the crowd by, in doing wrong. When you give a testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. I think there's two parts there. There's one is being honest and a person of integrity in, in, when you're called in to, to give a, a statement. But the set, first part was don't follow the crowd in doing wrong. If you know it's wrong, you know what you're doing is wrong. Don't engage in it. And, and the classic parent example, if all your friends jumped off a bridge, would you do it too? The classic parent example. The truth here is the crowd is seldom right. 
The masses are often making the worst decisions. We've got to go by what God's Word says, not by popular opinion. Stand strong in what is righteous, even if it seems all your family, all your friends, all your co-workers are against you. Stand for what is right. That is just. Finally, there's a promise for us. Because honestly, life isn't fair. We live in a cursed world, brothers and sisters. We live in a world where there is death. We live in a world where there is hunger. We live in a world where there is people treating other people unfairly. We live in a world where, where oftentimes people who are simply trying to follow what God calls them to do are abused and tortured, particularly in other countries. Not, not as much here that we're seeing. We're beginning to oftentimes see a little bit. There are churches who are trying to worship and are being given fine upon fine upon fine. We saw recently where people were out worshiping and they got arrested as they were worshiping. There's a pastor recently who held church service, and I haven't heard if he um, what's happened to him yet, but he was arrested for having service. And if his if, and they were they were they were considering whether to charge him for every single individual person that had been in the room, which could tally up to years in prison if they decided to go through with it. We live in a world that oftentimes does see unjust, but that injustice does not come from our God. God's promise, Luke 18, 7 through 8. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? A day is coming. A day is coming where all will be reckoned with. And true, complete, holy justice will be attained. And it will be God's doing. And we who have feel that we have been wronged, we will see, our eyes will be open. we'll find out what, what was really going on. And if there was evil intent behind it, that evil will be dealt with. We don't know all the ramifications. We don't know, we don't know all the ins and outs of how that judgment will go. And I don't have time to go into a lot of it now, but we can trust in the day that we serve a God who part of his character is justice, and one day it will be fulfilled. And so what we do is we try to live it out now. We try to help the people who are hurting. We try to deal honestly with each other. We try to deal, we try to speak towards what is right and, and vote for what is right here in our nation where we're allowed to do that. And then with each other, we deal with each other with mercy. We don't just like mercy. We love kindness. We love showing each other mercy. And then we walk humbly. And that doesn't mean it's wrong to have a nice little swagger, a, a, a jovial disposition, a playful a playful. Um, spirit about you. But when it comes when you and God and honestly with other people, in your heart there needs to be a humility that God is in charge and you aren't. That God is perfect and I'm not. That I am, am marred by sin and God is holy. And, and that humility will play out in our dealings with each other and with the world around us. Our world is calling us to a perverse understanding of justice. Let us stand for what is biblical and do justly and love mercy and walk humbly with our God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. I pray 
that from the beginning of our time that we can begin to feel the bonds of fellowship and that as our praise to you rallies our hearts that they will also turn towards each other and I pray that our love will speak volumes I pray that old wounds will be healed I pray for restoration I pray that we can be people not full of arrogance and anger towards you that you will remind us of all the many ways you bless us. Turn our hearts to you. Turn our lives to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.